my dear friend, I'm very happy to talk to you today again. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I welcome you to our appointment, The Truth with Kiria. God bless you. Today, we are starting with a new topic, which is when God becomes quiet on you. Shall I come again? When God becomes quiet on you. Wow. And we will start by explaining how God can be quiet on someone. Remember, God is a person. He has created us in his likeness and in his image, which means most of his behaviors, we have them. So when we ask the question, when God becomes quiet on someone, we can ask the same question by saying, when someone becomes quiet on the other. There is something about the verb to become. It means before then, it was not so. So if God becomes quiet on you, it means he has not been quiet before. And if he has not been quiet before, how was he talking to you? How was he interacting with you? How could you feel that God was interested in you and that he could talk to you, you could talk back to him. How was it? It is a topic that we, take, we will take by stages. Let us start by saying, by reviewing a little bit the various manners in which God can talk to somebody. How, to, how does God talk to you, to me? Well, can I put to you that as I am talking now, and you are listening to me, uh, it may be God talking to you. Actually, that is what it is supposed to be. That is why the, the, the show is called The Truth with Kenya. The Truth is capital T, capital T. Capital T for the, capital T for truth. To say the word of God, there is no other truth. And I forbid myself from talking to you about anything that doesn't have to do with the word of God, the truth. So ultimately, if I come before you, I'm supposed to be bringing a message from God. And I thank God that I have a mouth I can speak, and you have ears you can hear. God talks to those who have ears to hear. But you may be deaf, yet God can talk to you. Why? He can talk to you in your heart. He can talk to you in your mind. He definitely talks to you in your spirit. How? I'm not being practical. Well, let's just say, um, as I'm talking to you, you can be hearing another voice that is telling you, watch out for the 10th minute. There is a message for you. By the way, I don't know. Maybe it is a prophecy for someone. If it is your case, grasp it in Jesus' name. If you have heard something like that, it can be something else. It is God talking to you because there is no other person. There may be no other person where you are. Maybe you are in your sitting room or in your bedroom. You are just watching the show. And there is no human being around you. And this is something that is not coming from the television that you are watching. So if you have heard anything, it can be God. It can be your own spirit reflecting on something. It can be the enemy, which I don't wish you. But this is one of the ways God can talk to you. God can talk to you, again, in your consciousness by uh, reminding you of something or by making you think ahead of time about something that is to happen or that is to be presented. Meanwhile, you are focused on something. God has his way of taking us out of time while we are in time and bringing us back in time. He created time and stepped out of time so that he could master it and make us join him sometimes outside time. It is a different topic. Bear with me. God can use a human being 
It's up to you. As I said before, it could, he could be using me now. God can wait for you to be unconscious when you are lying down and sleeping. As you are sleeping, he gives you dreams. Has he not said in Joel that in the last days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, that our, our old men will dream dreams, our old people, I should say, not just the men, the women too, that uh, our young people will prophesy? Has he not said it? So ha when he talks about dreams, it means the person is sleeping. You cannot have a dream when you are uh, awake. So in your dreams, God can be speaking to you. And it can come as him speaking to you and you know he's speaking to you, or he can take you through some events while you are dreaming. It can also happen through visions. Some people call it trances. I would say upon visions. You are awake, like, like now. You are seeing something that everybody around you is seeing, and at the same time, you are seeing something that no one is seeing. Let me give you an example. Um, that is a personal testimony. I was talking with somebody in a reception somewhere. We were smiling to one another. And at a certain point of time, I saw the same person who was smiling. The person was still smiling to me. And at the same time, the person was doing something like this and was running away, kind of running away. So it was two different plans, two different realms. And the best of it is that when the vision disappeared and I came back to only the physical realm, that person also in the, the physical realm looked at me. We exchanged some looks and both of us understood that each one of us has been in the spiritual realm and has gone through the same scene. And we came back to the physical. I hope you have already reached points like that where God has taken you through such experiences. If not, Paul says you can crave spiritual blessings, spiritual gifts you can ask. If you want it, ask. Not for fun, not for pride, but to serve God. Because when he reveals such things to you, it is for a purpose. Uh, suffice it to, for me to say that, of course, that person was not a Christian. I just pray that by now, the person has become a Christian. But it was just showing me that we were in different kingdoms, spiritual kingdoms. That was it. Praise God. So it can be through open visions also. God can use events to talk to you. You see something happening and you draw your conclusion like whatever a man sows, he reaps. Or, well, after the tears of the night comes the, the, the laughter of the morning. Out of events that have been happening either to you or to people close to you or outside, whatever, whatever. God can speak to you through things. He can even speak to us through animals. I don't really crave that one. In the process of this, uh, um, this episode, maybe, I will, come to you, uh, I will come to explain to you what it is. So remember our topic, when God becomes quiet on you. God has so many ways of talking to us. I have not finished. The list can never finish. He's, God is the ancient of days, yet no one can foretell what he will say. And no one can say, because he has done it this way before, this is the way he's going to do it today. No, no one can predict how God is going to do something. All we can predict is, if he has said something, that that thing is set up. That's it. So when God is asking us to focus on this topic, that when he becomes quiet on someone, it means that there are some people out there listening to me who have had some encounters with God, who have had a kind of close relationship with God, and who at this present time may be kind of far away from God. Or they are on the slide. They are sliding away from him, and God is ringing the bell. My son, my daughter, beware. If you continue on that path, very soon, you will no more hear my voice because you are going too far. If that is your case, 
I'm happy for you because God says, I rebuke and I chastise those whom I love. If you can still hear the voice of rebuke, if you can still hear the voice of warning, it means that God is not yet done with you. Please heed his voice. And this is valid for myself. Now, when God is saying he is becoming quiet on somebody, do you know that it can be a whole group? It can be a family. It can be a community. It can be uh, a city, a country. It can be, let us say, anything that has to do with human beings who are in touch with God. Um, in the first book of Samuel, the very, very first chapters, actually, I would say chapter 3, I, I, I just want to read verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Samuel was in the temple of God. Eli was the high priest in the temple of God. Samuel was ministering in the temple of God under the leadership, the mentorship of Eli the high priest. Yet, the word of God was rare. Uh, some other versions say the word of God was scarce. It was not regular. It was not often that God will talk to his people. And this version says there was no widespread revelation. Why revelation? When someone says hello to you, is there a revelation is that in that? No. But when God speaks to you, there is always a revelation in it. How do I know? Jeremiah 33, verse 3, he says, call upon me, and I will, he doesn't say, answer you. Oh, let me read so that I will not paraphrase. Every Christian normally knows this, this scripture by, by, by head, you know. But I don't want to, to paraphrase. By the way, my, my, my version of the Bible may not be the same that you have. Uh, and knowing that I read in, in many languages, I may, I may be tempted to paraphrase or to translate from one language to the other. Let me just read it. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. You see, this version says, Call to me, and I will answer you. Did I say that he doesn't say, I answer you? This version says, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. But this is my question. How many of us call upon God asking him to show us things? It is not often that we do that. Most of the times when we call upon him, we have an issue. There is a problem. And we want it fixed. We want it solved. So we say, God, how do I go about this? Or if it is something that is reoccur reoccurring time and again, and we have done all sorts of prayers. If it is repentance, we have done it. Uh, deliverance, we have done it. Uh, is it for healing? We have done it. Is it uh, vowing to do this and that? We have done it and we have kept our, our word. Is it uh, condemning, cursing? We have done it. Is it blessing? What is it? We have done everything. Then at that point, we can come to God and say... that I have not grasped yet? Have I be beating the air? Is it that I took my sword and I've been beating the waters so I achieve no result? 
What is it? That is the extreme when we have tried everything. Because most of the times when we have an issue and we know a good amount of the word, the, the path that we know we apply. For example, we all start with Matthew 7.7. 7. Will I offend you by asking you what it says? It says, ask and it shall be given to you. Uh, uh, seek and you will find. Knock at the door and it shall be open to you. We all know that. So when we need something, daddy, please, I'm asking. We ask. But the way it shall be given to us, do we always understand that? Because when we ask for something, whether from God or from any other person, we should be ready to hear one of these three answers. He says, call upon me, call to me, and I will answer you. These are the three answers that we should expect. Either it is, oh yes, why not take it? So it is yes, a straight yes, I need it, yes, and we receive. And that is the perfect one that we are all longing for. There's another response that is, no, it is not going to happen. It is a dead end. It is a no-go area, a red zone. I'm not giving it to you. Period. And it is a no and a no for good. And there is another response that can take many forms, but basically it is saying, not now. And one of the forms is silence. God says nothing. When he has not responded, has, can you assume that he said yes? If you assume so and you don't receive the thing, then you know that he hasn't said yes. Or will you assume that he said no? You better not. Paul said, I have this thorn in my flesh and I kept on asking God to remove it. Three times I asked and finally he told me, no, I'm not removing it, but my grace is sufficient for you. My friend, if it's you've been asking God for something, for years man, even, and you have not yet received it, one, and second, you have not heard him telling you, no, keep on asking. Keep on asking, and you will see also that in the process of time, your asking will change. I will come back to that one later on. So I was telling you the third response can be not now. And it can be said by the way of silence. It can be said by the way of redirecting your focus to something else. Like you say, God, give me a new job. And what he shows you is your neighbor who is starving. And he wants you to buy him a, a bag of rice. It has nothing to do with you asking for a new job. But actually what he's telling you is that his priority for the time being is not you getting a brand new job, but it is using you to feed the neighbor that is starving. Can you say that that answer is a no? Can you say that answer is a yes? It just means I have put your file on the table. I will deal with it later. Or I will make you know later how I have dealt with it. So it is another way of response. Of course, I cannot give you the whole list of the ways that God uses to respond to us. But one thing is sure. If you are a genuine child of God and you have not exhausted his patience, are you jumping on your seat? <laughs> Don't jump. There are instances in which the, the patience of God himself is exhausted. I pray that none of us will reach that point. And I believe that is why he's saying we should be careful about this topic. When I, God, become quiet on someone, if we don't want to exhaust his patience, both you and me should reassess ourselves, our walk with God, and repent fast, because he doesn't despise any contrite heart. So I'm coming back to what I was telling you, how in the times, in the days of Eli and Samuel, the word of God was cast. How in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God himself says, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great things that you, do, you don't know. Does it then mean that whenever I call God, even when I'm asking for something, he's going to show me great things? Why? Things that I don't know? It is because most of the times we bring before God requests that are not documented enough. 
we ask out of what we know. And he knows more than we do. And sometimes he just wants us to come with our request. And in responding to us, what he will do is that he will give us a larger perspective of the whole issue. And then, as our eyes will open to the sites that we have not seen before, we ourselves may even cancel our request or reshape it in another way. Say, ah, I didn't know that it was like this. Ah, I didn't know that this one is happening like that. Ah, I didn't know that I was supposed to do this. We ourselves will change our request. That is why he says, call upon me and I will show you great things that you don't know. In the Bible, it is written, God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Depending on the version you read, it can be for lack of revelation. Have we not said that whenever God talks to us, there is a revelation? First Samuel 3, 1 says, the word of God was cast. There was no widespread revelation. That is the, the, the quality, the nature of the word of God. Whenever God speaks, there is a revelation in it. If you can hear the word of God and take no revelation from it, it means that your spiritual sensitivity is not enough. You are kind of dormant. You are kind of dull. May the Holy Spirit come in and push his fire in you. Or if you were on fire before and now you are going down, may the Lord rekindle his fire in you. You may be wondering where is she going. My brother, my sister, so far, nothing seems to be connected to you. Fine. But do you know that as a Christian, you are supposed to be mentoring other people? It may not be for you. For you. It may be for your neighbor or another soul in the body of Christ, someone that you will have to give counsels to very soon. I don't know. What I know is that you and me are stewards of whatever word of God we ever come across. God does not speak for no reason. And when he says, what if I become quiet on you? It means he has sown for a while. And now, he's been ex expecting a harvest for a while too, and he didn't get anything, and he's saying, huh, do you know that scripture? I give it to you as a homework. If you don't find it for the, our next episode, I promise you I will, bring, I will give you the reference, but do your homework. There is a part of the word where God says, please judge between my vineyard and me. What is it that I have not done for my vineyard? I have plugged the, 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 the ground. I have made a, a wall around it to pro protect it from uh, the strangers or, and thieves. I have uh, sown the seed. I have watered it. I have taken care of the plant. I have done everything. And in due season, when the fruits were supposed to come out, they didn't come out. Tell me, what else was I supposed to do? To do to my vineyard? Tell me. People, if I have invested so much to get no result, okay, now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to uproot it, destroy the whole place, and then do something else there. I pray for you. I pray for me that none of us will drive our God to make such a decision about us. That we say, this one is a good for nothing. Remember the fig tree with Jesus? Jesus was hungry. He saw this fig tree that was blossoming, had plenty of leaves, fresh ones, yet no fruit. Jesus got angry. Has God been feeding you all around and you are bringing forth no fruit? Reconsider your ways. I don't know who this message is for. And actually, I have not followed the way I have prepared it at all, I believe this is just an introduction. God is reminding us of the blessed times when he was talking to us that, well, we will call to him, he will talk to us. Sometimes we will not even call and he will talk to us. He says, I have shown myself to these people who were not even seeking my face. Uh, to people who were not looking for me, I said, here I am. Yet they didn't pay attention. The book of Job says, God speaks one way or the other, and men do not pay attention. 
please allow me to stop here by just asking you to search your life, to assess your fellowship with God, and to see all the ways that God has spoken to you so far. Of course, in church, people preaching. Of course, in the ministration of a song, the choir singing or someone singing. Or, of course, in the sharing of testimonies. The book of Revelation says that we have overcome the accuser of the brethren with what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So whenever a testimony is being shared, a genuine one is being shared to your ears, it is telling you this is what the word of God says. This is what God has done first. This is how the enemy came in to destroy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy has stepped in, John 10.10, 10, but yet God said, I have come. Jesus said, I have come for my people to have life and to have it more abundantly. Not to have life abundantly, but to have it more abundantly, which means that they had it abundantly before. And the thief came in, he stole, he killed, he destroyed, but Jesus came to restore. So, check it. When you hear a testimony, that is the structure of the testimony. It should be saying before things were good, then the enemy came in and made, it, made them bad, then I cried to God, or people cried to God, or God just heard the, the, distress, the distress of my heart or, or of his people's heart, and he stepped in, kicked out the destroyer, and restored, and even did much more than it was before. God has been talking to you through testimonies. Don't tell me it hasn't happened. He has allowed you to be reading his Bible. He has allowed you to be hearing messages like this one. That you say, you may, one may say, I, I have nothing to take out of it. Are you serious? You have nothing to take out of it? Praise God. So reassess your relationship with God, your channels of communication with God. And during our next episode, we will go further than this. I didn't know that it will take this long for the introduction, but God is... I, I perceive that God is seriously concerned about someone who has been his close friend and who is now sneaking away, maybe even without knowing it, or who is making himself stubborn. Remember 1 Samuel 3, 1? When you read it, when God decided to talk to Samuel, it was in the same chapter. First thing he told him, he told him that Eli, his mentor, the high priest, had been disrespectful and he, God, was rejecting him and his two sons and his whole family, his whole lineage from priesthood. I pray that that will not be your portion, that will not be my portion. God wants his bond with someone to be restored. Let me pray with you. Jesus has come for our reconciliation, the reconciliation of humanity with our creator. And he has said, whatever I do, you will do greater works than this. John 14, verse 12. I will not claim that this is greater, but I just want us, I pray that God will speak to our hearts that this reconciliation for which Jesus paid such a dear price will not be lost in our lives. Until our next episode, Please do your homework. Get ready. I believe. You know God says, when I reveal, it is to redeem. I believe we are on the way of redemption. And I also believe that some of us have been in tune with God. They have not slipped away. But God is bringing a, a warning that, hey, watch your ways. The devil has sought to sift you. That is what Jesus told Peter. But I have prayed for you so that once you are established, you will strengthen your brethren. So it is not just about you. It is not just about me. It is about so many people who depend on the way we, we will allow God to use us. God bless you. I'm very happy to have shared this with you. May the Lord bless you.